My name is Professor Nicola Graham Kevin, uh, and I work at the University of Central Lancashire in the School of Psychology, and I'm also the uh, lead for Violence and Aggression Research in the Criminal Justice Partnership. And today I'm going to be talking about coercive control and domestic violence. So coercive control has been um, criminalised in the UK and other countries are following suit, suit including North, uh, Southern Ireland as well. And it's held within the realm of domestic abuse generally. And what our government says about domestic abuse is that whilst all legislation is gender neutral and men can also be victims of this offence, uh, statistics consistently show that women and girls are disproportionately affected by crimes of domestic violence and abuse. This includes coercive control. Uh, and as their evidence, they uh, cite data from 2014-2015, where over 90% of defendants in domestic abuse flag cases uh, where the police are recording a crime uh, that these had male perpetrators and female victims uh, are about 84% of all victims. The problem of the uh, with relying on police recorded crime is known um, and therefore if you actually want to know a reliable figure of whether men and women are equally likely to be victimised you need to look further than who actually comes to the notice of the police and you need to look at the empirical research which is published in peer review journals um, which has been rigorously reviewed and thought to be robust. So we're going to do that because as Richard tells us, that which is provable ought not to be believed in science without proof. So what we're going to do is have a little look at some of the data to see how much... Uh, the statement by our government is supported by robust empirical research. When we do look at empirical research, we find that since the very first survey that asked men and women in a general survey, not a crime survey, but a general survey about their use of specific acts of aggression such as slapping, kicking, hitting, beating, threatening, using a weapon and so forth. When these were asked of a general population um, in, at the end of the 1960s, they found roughly equal numbers of men and women reported that they had used aggression towards a partner in the last year. And this figure remained the same whether you asked women about what they had done and what their partners had done to, to them. They, they also reported this similar rate. Uh, and Marty Fiebert began collating data on this and uh, up to 2012 he found nearly 200 studies published that found that men and women generally have a report of similar prevalence of using violence towards a partner in any one, one given year. And this violence isn't just between adult men and women, it's seen early in relationship formation. So adolescents are equally likely to report that girls and boys are using similar levels of aggression in uh, relationships, or actually more typically, girls are self-reporting more perpetration towards boys than boys are put, uh, reporting towards girls. And interestingly, in spite of the uh, way that domestic violence is normally talked about in the media, where it's a, a violent partner and a, a non-violent uh, victim, they actually found in adolescent relationships, most of this pa intimate partner violence or relation uh, dating violence is actually bi-directional. So boys and girls are both hitting each other in relationships. So if, if a girl's hitting a boy, he's likely to be hitting her back. And vice versa. And that similar risk factors predict whether a boy will be aggressive in an adolescent relationship or a girl. This pattern of bi directional abuse and female perpetrated abuse 
is not restricted to adolescents. When you look at uh, reviews of the literature, so this one was published in 2012, and it looked at all published research that looked at men and women's use of aggression in relationships. And what you can see here, the furthest right column, is male and females both using aggression. So bidirectional, uh, mutual aggression, there's lots of terms for it. But essentially, both partners are aggressive. And you see that with the exception of female orientated cl clinical samples, which are female victim samples, all the other uh, categories have at least 40% of their relationships bi-directional and in general population and community samples this is nearly 60 percent so it's quite clear that the government's personification of domestic violence being a problem of female violence uh, female victimization at the hands of a male completely ignores that most relationships both part uh, where there is violence but most of those will have violence from both partners Now this can seem like very much at odds with what we see in other parts of society where it seems that certainly if you're looking at uh, aggression on a night, night out and so forth it always appears that men are more likely to be the violent party and that has led people to say well there's something wrong with how you're measuring domestic violence asking people what they've done in a year for some reason is not a valid measure but some of the really most valid and um, persuasive research is where you've got a longitudinal cohort. So in a longitudinal cohort study, you follow a group of people over an extended period of time. And Terry Moffat and her colleagues did, uh, conducted a survey while they're still following these participants. Well, they started following these participants when they were infants so they followed a thousand participants and they have continued following them. I think they're up to probably the participants now will be in the 30s, mid 30s, I would imagine. And their research was always focused on aggression. So generally aggressive behaviour. And they got reports from lots of different people. Now, the beauty of this cohort is that the participants in this survey trust the researchers. So they report on lots of illegal activities, including their uh, crime, drug use and so forth. They know that it's anonymous, they know they're not going to be judged uh, and they're very open with uh, their researchers. And the researchers see them every three years. They don't just ask the participant. Uh, as they got older and started dating, maybe they would then talk to the participant's partner. They've also talked to parents, teachers and so forth. And they see a really interesting, interesting pattern in aggression. So if you look at the chart, what you'll see at the far farthest left is PT. So this is parent and teacher reports of aggression. So when children are at school, men are a blue bar, women are a red. Boys are more likely to be aggressive according to parent and teacher reports than girls. And that's what we would expect to see. When you, uh, As they get a little bit older and you start seeing self-reports of aggressive offending behaviour, so criminal, criminal aggression, you see this pattern again. So boys are more likely to be uh, criminally aggressive than girls. If you ask people who know these boys and girls, classmates, friends, who's the most aggressive, you'll find that it's boys and not girls. If you look at convictions for aggression, you'll see it's boys and not girls. But this pattern flips when you get to intimate partner violence, domestic violence. Then, when we get to there, you find that actually girls self-report more aggression than boys. And when it's partner reports, the same pattern emerges, that, that women are using more aggression than men. Not a lot more, but more. And even where it's clinically significant levels, so this is where police have been called, there's been injuries, you know, the, the type of domestic abuse that one might expect to end up in police statistics, there is no significant difference in the numbers in terms of whether it's men or women. So when you ask people what they do, you get a very different picture to what you see in criminal justice data. Now, none of this data is hidden from those who make policy. Indeed, they're very much aware of it. They just choose to not engage with it and instead use unreliable me measures 
such as police recorded crime. And by their own admission, they know police recorded crime doesn't capture crime because we have victim surveys for that the very reason that there's many reasons why one wouldn't report a crime. And one thing we do know from crime surveys when they've asked this explicitly with UK populations, most men who report that their partner has beat, hit them or kicked them or beat them or used a weapon on them in any given year, when asked, is this domestic violence, most men say no. Only 10%, I think, was the data I saw when I saw it this last I asked. 10% of men said it was domestic abuse, uh, whereas something like 60% of women recognise their victimisation as domestic abuse. So if men don't see their behaviour as domestic abuse, they're probably not going to phone the police. It doesn't mean it's not harmful, it doesn't mean it's not hurtful. So feminist research has always been very strong, um, well, very strong in, in volume at least, uh, in the academic literature. And for many years, in spite of the data that we looked at earlier, showing equal levels of uh, prevalence of perpetration of partner violence in any given year, most samples never ever asked men about their victimisation or women about their perpetration. And from, therefore, for many, many years, the data showing this symmetry or uh, the fact that men and women appeared similar when you actually asked them what they did was completely ignored. Eventually, the sheer weight of data and some very, very persistent um, researchers such as Murray Strauss, it became untenable for feminist researchers to ignore the data showing that men and women report using similar levels of aggression. There was arguments for some time, years in fact, about the measure uh, that the instrument used, the conflict tactic scale, was um, somehow biasing results and it wasn't a reliable measure. However, eventually even these arguments could not anymore hold, hold back this tide of realisation. And it is at this moment where society could have accepted that men and women both use aggression and whether one sex uses it a little bit more than the other really isn't relevant. What we should be looking to do is help people who are subject to aggression um, not have to be subjected to that and people who are using aggression help them to learn ways of behaving which are not violent. However, that was missed because researchers such as Evan Stark decided that actually what we need to do is not just about violence, it's about coercive control. And coercive control it became the new feminist cause. So Evan Stark wrote a book um, about coercive control. And having been researching this, and I'll talk about some of my work uh, later, having researched this for several years prior to his book coming out, I was interested to hear what he'd say, and it seemed very quote, uh, very academic, lots of references. I was impressed with his writing. And when we got sort of to about 100 page, just after 100 pages, he made this statement. At this point, I asked readers to take two things on faith, that the pattern of intimidation, isolation and control is unique to men's abuse of women and that it is critical to explain away women becoming trapped in abusive relationships in ways that men do not. So what Evan Stark was referring to um, is this idea of uh, power and control. Power and control is something you will see our government say lots of times about men's power and control. Power and Control comes from uh, Minnesota, a, a, a feminist group who were working with women who were subject to violence by partners and they're uh, developing a programme for violent males. Understanding domestic violence, intimate partner violence as a patriarchal, stemming from patriarchal beliefs that men believe that they should be the boss and therefore any um, any things that women do, which is uh, challenges their supremacy, uh, can be met with violence or coercion. And this is the, the, where Evan Stark was basing his idea, that 
Men and women may both use aggression in relationships, but actual domestic violence wasn't just aggression. It was coercive aggression. Um, and this power and control will is widely used uh, to this day, talking about the different ways that men can coerce women. And this is where our home office is essentially beginning its move, began its move towards criminalising coercive control. Indeed, it was the reason they decided to criminalise coercive control was from lobbying by feminist organisations and feminist academics to create a, a new law so that it could be clearly shown that women are actually the most likely victims of domestic abuse because this pattern of coercive and controlling behaviour is primarily a form of violence against women and girls and it's, it is this societal gender inequality. So what the Home Office is saying here in its document in 2015 is controlling or coercive behaviour is primarily a form of violence against women and girls. So if that is the case, we should see in research that when you look at levels of coercive control, there's a clear difference between men's use and women's use. And it was at this point, well, it was prior to this, it was at this point in the 90s when I first heard about coercive control that I thought, hmm, that's an interesting premise. What we need to do, though, is not take this at face value. We need to look, again, at the vigorous peer-reviewed empirical literature to see whether this statement is supported by the evidence. Is it an evidence-based statement? Now, if you Google coercive control, you'll find lots and lots of articles, websites, support and so forth for women. If you go into academic databases, which is where I spend my days, and put in coercive control, you will similarly find hundreds of articles that actually talk about coercive control as some, something men do to women, and um, that it's around this patriarchal desire to control women. However, you cannot say that this is something that men do to women, uh, that this is something that differs between men and women, unless you ask men and women what they do. Otherwise, if you only ask women about their victimisation, you have no inkling as to what women's perpetration of coercive control is. Neither do you have any inkling about men's victimisation of coercive control. So what we need to do to understand whether the statement by our government is actually supported by evidence is we have to look at research which has actually asked men and women about their use or their victimisation by or their perpetration of coercive control. It is only by look, asking men and women that we will know if there is a difference between men and women and therefore if there is a difference between men and women's use then we can say potentially okay that first part of what, how our government understands coercive control is supported by research. So let's have a look at some of the data. So there was a European funded research survey which looked at uh, coercive control and domestic violence across six European countries in Q including the UK uh, and there's some data there from the different countries on this uh, chart to the right. Uh, what you can see is that what they found was men and women predominantly experience intimate partner violence and control as both victims and perpetrators. There were few significant sex differences within cities. The results support the need to consider men and women as both potential victims and perpetrators when approaching IPV. So what they found here was that there was, certainly in the UK, and most of Europe, there was no difference in men and women's reports of their, their use of coercive control or their partner's use of coercive control. And this isn't unusual when uh, you ask men and women about their own use of coercion. Indeed, uh, analysis from 32 nations, International Date in Violence Research Consortium in 2004, found that which is a good decade before our government made the statement that we read before, within a couple relationships, 
Domination and control by women occurs as often as it does by men, and both are strongly associated with the perpetration of partner violence, and it's similarly for men and women. So there is no difference in levels of perpetration of coercive control across 32 nations. And this pattern is found in older couples as well, so couples where they're over 60 or over. But there's no gender differences, there's no difference in prevalence between men and women who are coercive and, and violent. So domestic violence within coercive control is found here as well. And further evidence that this isn't something around men and women per se, and it certainly can't be something around men's expectations of coercive control because of patriarchal dominance, because we found exactly the same patterns in uh, same-sex relationships as well. So with uh, heterosexual couples are similar to homosexual couples, lesbian couples. And possibly, probably most interesting um, among the data is that the Home Office Controlling All Coercive Behaviour in Intimate Relationships Statutory gui Guidance Framework, which is telling us that it's predominantly something women experience, their own data actually shows that the prevalence of coercive control for men and women is very similar. So in this table here, which you can see on their website, uh, 46.48 versus 53%. Very little difference in men and women's experience of coercive control in, in their own data. It's evident that the authors of this report were surprised at these findings, as they said, this is their words, we expected this difference between the sexes would vary between the two questions based on our expert guidance from the Office of National Statistics Domestic Abuse Steering Group, um, who largely, well, were within which were represented some very prominent feminist researchers uh, in the UK, although there were no um, researchers with a non-feminist voice, although there are several of us in the UK, none of us were asked to be on this panel, so maybe they would have been less surprised had they had some more balanced academic input. Um, however, they say, some of the group differences suggest that the sex difference would be larger for con controlling behaviour than non-physical abuse, and their findings are not consistent with this expectation. So they're obviously in a difficult position here, because this is in the body of a report that starts by saying that domestic abuse uh, in terms of quality control is something it, uh, experienced by girls and uh, women far more than men and boys but their own data isn't supporting this so again there's rather than accepting this there's a there's a need now to explain it in such a way that we can maintain this worldview that women are still the victims in spite of the fact that women and men are using coercive control at similar rates, which wasn't expected. So rather than just accepting that finding, we now need to move the goalposts yet again. And we'll get to that soon. A slight digression at this point. Um, when I was doing my undergraduate degree many years ago, I wanted to do my research project on why men beat women. Uh, that was very much my understanding from a very feminist perspective I held and I went to see my supervisor uh, Professor John Archer and explained what I wanted to look at and he told me this data about men well women hit men too and I thought well that's not that's not the case certainly not in any sort of large number and he challenged me to go away and prove that men and women uh, didn't seem quite similar in terms of uh, relationship violence and at that point I found a paper by Michael Johnson called Patriarchal Terrorism and I was very impressed with this paper and its premise is coercive control. So Johnson was really one of the first people ever to talk about this idea of coercive control as a way to explain the findings of gender symmetry in the use of physical violence and still maintain a feminist worldview. And his central premise was that there's two types of relationship violence. 
there's non-coercive relationship aggression and that's equally likely to be used by men and women and that's the type of research you'll see in a general survey however the research that people when people talk about domestic violence what they mean is this coercive controlling violence and he called it patriarchal terrorism so for his mind it, this was something men did to women and it was only men who were coercively violent in relationships and and his premise was Therefore, although nobody should hit anybody in relationships, we can still ignore female perpetration and female vict uh, and male victimisation because essentially it's not as serious and what we're talking about, what we, what we should be concerned about is this coercive violence. And I thought, fantastic, I'll, I'll research that. At the point at which this paper was published, there was no published research, it was a... Um, a position piece that he published and so I decided to prove my supervisor wrong and Michael Johnson right by researching whether uh, to prove I went in hoping to prove that women were not coercively violent and that was something just men did so to do this I created a, uh, a measure uh, like a questionnaire to measure coercive control using the power and control wheel that I showed before and created the measure. The only one I didn't include was the use of male privilege because I wanted to be able to ask men and women the same questions because I thought that is the only robust, scientifically valid way of seeing whether men and women use coercive control at different levels. So I uh, sampled violent men in prison uh, with uh, domestic violence I sent, uh, sampled women in refuges who were victims and then I got a general sample and what I found was I could categorize people based on Johnson's ideas so some there were groups of men who were coercively violent and groups of women who were subject to ex extreme violence also were subject to this coercion and then there was a subgroup of people where there was lower levels of violence and lower levels of coercion. So I thought, well, that's fantastic. However, whilst writing uh, up these papers, and I sent them off and I got them published, and they've been very cited, including by Michael Johnson many times in the literature, and continue to be uh, cited. However, um, it became apparent to me that I hadn't been entirely fair in my sampling, in the fact that I had sampled for women who were known victims of domestic violence men who were known perpetrators of domestic violence as well so I had biased my sample by actually seeking out people who were already known to fit into categories so it was not a fair test at all so I needed to do some more research although I was still firmly committed to this idea I did feel that it needed to be more robust than these studies were so if men are using violence towards women to co coercively control them in a patriarchal manner, then I would expect them to have what we would call instrumental beliefs about aggression, so that I am justified in using violence. I use these, uh, violence is used to get somebody to do something that I want them to do or stop doing something I don't want them to do. So essentially, I'm using it to control somebody else. That's in... Uh, in contrast to expressive aggression, which is aggression which people use when they're upset, when they're angry, when they're frightened, when they're sad, and so forth. So what I thought was, is it, where uh, Michael Johnson, the way he uh, spoke about this, that I would expect that men would use instrumental aggression, and women, where they used it, would be using it just expressively, so just to let out emotion, maybe because they're scared, or uh, and so forth. So I conducted further research and what I found was that in, uh, men and women involved in intimate terrorism used controlling aggression and physical aggression. But contrary to what I was expecting, I found that control accounted for significant proportions of the variance in the use of physical aggression for all categories and on to the next slide. I expected that it would be men that used instrumental aggression. However, I found 
it wasn't. Both men and women's self-reported aggression and self-reported beliefs about their own use of aggression were very similar. So people who think that aggression uh, allows them to solve problems, to control another person, are using instrumental beliefs. But this isn't something that is only used by men. It wasn't generally only men, and it wasn't just these men who were intimate terrorists. Indeed, it seems that generally, whether you're using a lot of aggression and a lot of coercion or not, aggression tends to be a mix of feeling emotional and actually trying to get a partner to do something or stop doing something. It's not the, the uh, only used by so-called intimate or patriarchal terrorists. So, the research evidence doesn't suggest that coercive control is primarily a form of violence against women and girls. Girls and boys, men and women, seem to use aggression and coercion in, at similar levels. The next part of what our Home Office understands around this is that it is underpinned by wider societal gender inequality. And indeed, it does seem to be. So coercion that women uh, are victimised by, unfortunately, as very, very common throughout the literature, they don't even ask about males' experience of coercive control. Obviously, it's easier to do that if you're concerned that you might find that men are similar to women in, in experiences. So uh, Navala never asked anything about men, but what they did ask was about gender equality index, so how... Uh, much gender equality there was in a nation and how much coercive control the women in that nation experienced. And there is a relationship between gender equality and coercive control. And what we know, though, in the UK is we're quite high in gender equality and we're very low in coercive control. So the coercive control in our country is unlikely to be driven by patriarchal beliefs in the same way that we might see it in different cultures where patriarchal beliefs believes that men are the head of a household and women are meant to be subservient to them, coercive control could well be driven there by patriarchal beliefs. But in Western Northern European nations, that is unlikely to be the explanation as to why a man or a woman would be using coercive control, because those beliefs are not widely shared in the UK society. So what, why may people men say why wait may men use coercive control well if, it, if men were using coercive control to um coercive uh, controlling behaviors to coerce and manipulate a partner then you would expect they would be doing that in a quite a cold-blooded rational sort of way you wouldn't expect them to be feeling upset and angry and insecure and afraid as well and what we find is the complete opposite. So we find that those people who are more coercive, those men who are more coercive, these are men who are in treatment for domestic violence within the criminal justice system, this data on this slide, are actually have lower problem-solving skills and much, much less emotion regulation skills. So these men are not cold-blooded killers. They are the most emotional people in the sample. Indeed, the men in the sample who were uh, convicted domestic violence perpetrators with low levels of coercion had much better emotion regulation skills. So it looks from that data that actually men who, who are coercive are not doing it through patriarchal values. They're doing it because they find it very hard to manage very strong emotions in relationships. And research that I've conducted with uh, similar samples of men find that their use of coercive control is strongly related to um, poor stress tolerance generally around dysregulation, poor coping, not patriarchal beliefs. What's far more likely to be, to be behind Men in the criminal justice system's use of coercive control and violence towards a partner is actually 
their significant trauma history. So many, many, many of these men have experienced a lot of adverse childhood experiences, which we know are related to people having very, very difficult um, emotional inner worlds where their emotions are fast and strong and they are very difficult to manage. So, for example, if you look at a typical um, cohort of prisoners in England, male prisoners, you'll find that about 50% witnessed intimate partner violence or domestic abuse in childhood, uh, between 10 and 25% have been in care. Lots have problems coping, lots have gone without food, have no one to support them. Uh, a lot have been hit severely, uh, a lot of people have been afraid of family members. And these, these figures on this slide actually are of guys who are commu a community sample. So these are high levels of trauma in people who are being identified as domestic violence offenders. So this understanding by our government that domestic violence uh, in the form of coercive control stems from a power and control issue around patriarchal gender expectations is just very unhelpful. It's far more likely that this domestic violence can be understood from a clinical perspective, from a mental health perspective. And what we see in people that you work with, people I've worked with, is we find lots of traits of something called borderline personality disorder. Uh, and that is where people feel empty inside, they worry about being abandoned, they self-harm, they threaten or attempt suicide, and they have this very um, tendency to swing from loving to uh, hating people very quickly. T very, very much a borderline personality disorder type constellation. And this has been found for decades in men who are violent towards their partner where the bulk of the research is men, men's violence to women. This is the research which actually finds support for the, the reasons why this would be the case, not patriarchal attitudes. This is why when you ask the men about how they feel generally about their relationship, they will tell you that they find it really hard to control their emotions. That's not something somebody who's cold-bloodedly using aggression would say. They do get extremely angry, but that anger is around um, concerns around being uh, left, being deserted, and so forth. They find their mind won't focus when they're upset. And this is evidence of extremely high emotions. When emotions are very high, uh, cognition, your thought processes are interrupted as a, the blood flow is diverted from your frontal lobes to your amygdala for a, an emotional fast response. They often feel out of control, so they're not feeling in control, they're actually feeling out of control. And they feel that their, their behaviour is out of control and they cannot switch off from a problem. So this, this sounds like very emotional crimes, not instrumental, callous, calculated criminals, as they are conceptualised often in the literature. For this reason, it is important that we move away from these simplistic explanations of coercive control, which are actually flying in the face of empirical research. The research suggests that men and women are both likely to use coercive control and both likely to, uh, in the context of aggression, that that ag coercive control is probably more, much more likely to be driven by high emotions rather than some patriarchal, uh, calculated, instrumental use of aggression. And it's really important that we move away from a blaming and a who does what to whom to actually trying to understand that coercion is something that can be used by one partner, male or female, and often is used by both partners in relationships. And this is incredibly important because when people have children, coercive control is an extremely toxic environment for them to be brought up in. So research which has looked at coercive control in terms of parenting is interesting, and it is an overlooked factor. So this 
research on this slide is uh, is from 2019, and it's again a longitudinal study. So it's a good it's a study that looks at the same people over time. And they looked at 98 heterosexual couples uh, before just before uh, the baby was born, and then they followed them up one or two years later. What they found was the majority majority of couples reported at least some coercive controlling behaviour during that transition. So there was coercion prior to the baby being born, the transition into parent in parenthood, that that coercive control was highly bi-directional. So when one partner was being coercive, the other partner was being coercive also. But women were more likely than men to engage in coercive control before parenting. So where there was one party in that relationship who was more coercive, it was more likely to be the woman, not the man. And what they found was women's coercive control predicted their own, as well as the man's, perpetration of actual intimate partner violence or acts of physical aggression across that transition to parenthood. So it was women's coercion was the thing that would predict whether men or women in that relationship were aggressive. They also found that women's coercive control longitudinally predicted men's depression, harmful alcohol use, relationship dissatisfaction, poor co-parenting experiences, uh, low perceived parent incompetence, so the men felt if their partners were coercive they felt they weren't very good at being a parent and they also thought that their toddlers had a lot more problem behaviour. Men's coercive control was also longitudinally predictive of women's relationship dissatisfaction uh, and women's parenting stress. And similarly with the uh, women's in impact on uh, dads, da uh, the men's impact on mums, they had more perceptions that the infant had problem behaviour. And men's coercive control was associated with the woman's own use of ineffective parenting behaviour. So the, the authors here say these parents suggest that coercive control is common in community samples during the transition into parenthood and it predicts lower functioning. So we need to move away from some patriarchal theory which does not hold in countries such as the UK for the vast majority of the population and instead look at coercive control in terms of probably adverse childhood experiences of the, the perpetrators and their need to control the situation because they have such negative emotions, such strong negative emotions, that they're so overwhelming that they are uncontrollable. And therefore, what they seek to do instead is to try and control the environment, i.e. their partner. And this impact of children being exposed to coercive control and partner violence is exceedingly worrying. So here's another research uh, study. This was conducted in 2015. And they looked at 61 couples who engaged in coercive control in physical IPV. So these people were coercively controlling and used physical aggression towards their partner. So of these 61 couples, 33 were, were where only the mother was violent and coercive. 18, only the dad was using violence and being coercive and 10 where both parties were coercive and violent. They found that this coercive control was related to measures of child adjustment problems. So regardless of whether it's mum or dad and in this sample as in the previous one it's more likely to only be mum if anyone's coercive and m many of these relationships are coercive from both parties this has significant impacts on child adjustment problems. This is children who are internalising problems, so they're, they're withdrawn, uh, they're lacking confidence and so, uh, self-esteem, or they're externalising, where they're uh, making problems in the classroom, where showing aggressive and disruptive behaviour. These children are not going to be able to meet normal life goals if they're not helped, because they are being brought up in a home which is coercive, whether by mum, dad or both parties. This is a problem for society and for families. It's not a problem of patriarchy. So 
So although the majority of research on coercive control never asks women about their own use and never asks men about their victimisation, the vast majority just completely ignores it and assumes that it's women's victimisation. They never seek to test that. Probably for good reason, because they'll be quite aware that if you do test it, you don't find that pattern, and that does not fit with the narrative they wish to uh, push forward. You could argue that one would expect that, certainly from people in government, that they would be more interested in the evidence base than um, ideology, but that just doesn't seem to be the case. And it seems that the, the latest move, the, la the latest chess piece in this game um, that seems to have been playing out for decades, where first it was only women were victims of violence and then when they had to recognise that women could also be perpetrators, we brought in coercive control and uh, this idea that men have a patriarchal coercive control. When that is not supported by the research, then rather than accepting that actually coercion is probably... Um, the symptom of something psychological rather than something cognitive such as a patriarchal belief system one would hope that that would be what we, uh, our government and our clinicians would do and we could as a society move forward and try and work, uh, sort this out but instead they uh, decided to seek to again try and prove that women although women and men use coercion at similar levels even in their own data, we have to find a way to differentiate men and women. It has to be women that are more likely to be victims because that's what we believe. So it doesn't matter what the data says, no matter what the data says, it appears they will just keep moving the goalposts until they can find something that will fit their narrative. And, and this is really concerning. So one of the research areas, I'm an aggression researcher generally, and one, one of the things we know is that one of the most consistent differences between men and women, just in all research, not just violence, is that women and men differ in how much fear they report. So this doesn't matter whether you're asking men and women how afraid they are of a grizzly bear, which is massive and it really won't matter if you're a man or a woman. If that bear decides to grab you and eat you, it, you know, it's not going to help. Women are more afraid of large animals, more afraid of crime, even though women are statistically less likely to be victims of street crime. Women are more afraid on the street. Uh, men are far more likely to be murdered and assaulted than women. But women are more afraid. Women are more afraid of um, blood, disease, death, injury. Women are more afraid generally, and there are evolutionary reasons for that, which we haven't got time to get into. But if there was one thing you could do to try and bias the results against men and women being uh, equal in coercive control, is to try and bring in a test involving the term fear. And as these researchers suggest, the typology where you use fear as a determining factor is going to under, underestimate the prevalence of intimate partner violence experienced by men because men are socialised and maybe even evolved to not express vulnerability. So this is something we know is such a consistent sex difference without, throughout the literature. Anybody who didn't know the impact of this should not be doing research at this level with such societal impact, without looking what is the impact of adding a fear component to coercive control measures. However, either through ignorance or design, this is uh, what we've, uh, they have decided to do now. So as the research tells us, fear, measurement is the basis of all science. How you measure something very much determines what you find. And measurement problems beset a wide range of research issues and hinder the progress of a cumulative development of scientific knowledge. And one of these areas is fear of crime, and coercive control is a crime. And what we know here, among, they looked at 12 factors in this research, the most reliable predictor of fear of crime was gender. Women are consistently more afraid of crime than men. But we don't use this in any other crime. The fact that uh, men may not be more afraid of uh, may not voice 
fear of crime doesn't mean that they can be assaulted more in the street. They can't be beaten more in the street. They can't be robbed more in the street because the act is a criminal act. What they say here, what they tell researchers is that yes, no choices lead to false positives when asking questions that groups of people are most fearful. And so binary questions should be avoided in future research. In short, the moderate available analysis shows the simplest analysis produces conclusions that differ significantly from more complex models. So trying to now move the goalposts to, to say, well, who's most afraid of coercion? That is a simply simple model. Rather than going to more complex, nuanced models and understanding that gender, a broad category, isn't complex enough, instead we're going to use the one variable that any good researcher would know would be a way to slant figures uh, towards it looking like women were the greater victims than men. So in the document for the Home Office around uh, coercive control and developing a measure of coercive control, because they were finding similar levels of coercive control between men and women, which they didn't expect, and indeed they should have just been honest and said, which we don't want, they then decided to include impact questions. So this would allow them to decide, well, just the fact that somebody's been coercive is, isn't relevant, it's only how much you report being afraid of that behaviour. So these questions are asking about the fear, the violence will be used, uh, constantly living in fear, and so forth. These questions are exactly the type of questions you would ask if you wanted to uh, ensure that you had sex differences, that you found that women were more so than what men. The only one where you may find that there's a difference there is the last one, which is fear that you could lose your children. Because men will say, actually, they fear that. That is one of the things I hear men say they fear. Um, that is something that even men, with their reluctance to even recognise their own fear uh, in other situations, are so impacted by that, they will, they will actually acknowledge that is an actual fear. And when you look at the tables uh, of the data they use to develop the measure of coercive control, you can see these different impact factors. And you'll see that men are reporting lower levels of uh, fear, violence, or abuse against you, feeling unable and blood, and all these. What's interesting here as well is that although they had a, uh, to some, a little bit, uh, somewhat, uh, to a great extent, so they had lots of different levels. They, t they turned it into a binary measure, essentially. Either if you suffered any at all, so even a little bit of fear, versus or even very, very frightened, that was just collapsing to you suffered some fear versus none at all. So they turned the measure into a binary measure, which is what you're not, you've been told not to do by academic researchers. Uh, and predictably, using a fear variable, you suddenly start seeing differences in men and women. So you're seeing that women are reporting higher rates. I mean, the rates for men are still not, you know, shouldn't still be ignored. Uh, ignored. Still, you know, that sample of, you've got 18, nearly 19% men and 42% women, it's still not overwhelmingly, which are the figures that are often used regarding coercive control. But what inter is interesting is there is one item on their impact that does not show the same trend of women reporting somewhat more coercive control than men, so much more impact of coercive control. And that is fearing you would lose your children. So in there, there is at least one item that captures probably a large amount of the fear that men feel in relationships, which is if they actually leave, they will not be able to take their children and they will not be able to see them. If their partner's coercive, then they probably... Uh, justifiably concerned that they would use the children as a tool of punishment. And I literally could not believe what I read when I was reading the report because this is what they said. Responses to fear you could lose your contact with your children 
were marginally higher in relation to uh, behaviours being experienced by men by a partner than women. There was a concern among some members of the Office of National Statistics Domestic Abuse Steering Group, which I've already said were overrepresented with feminist scholars uh, when, uh, in terms of academics, no academics who weren't of a feminist perspective. Uh, they were concerned that this impact was likely to elicit a relatively high response among men and that this may not truly reflect coercive or controlling behaviour. So they decided to take it out. So the only item that actually men were higher than women, they took out. So not only could they, they are they using fear, but one of the items, they only, they, they only kept the items that showed a higher uh, endorsement for women and they literally got rid of the one that in, had the higher endorsement for men even though as a parent the worst thing anybody could do to me is take my children away from me so that impact to me is the most severe impact of all of those impacts if you have children uh, your your children's welfare always comes before your own and being separated from your children is literally the worst thing somebody could ever threaten you with as an af afterthought, the authors of the Home Office document actually reflected and say, said, it is possible that impacts experienced by men have not been well reflected in the trial questions, leading to an underrepresentation of male victims in the trial statistics. However, research suggests that when controlling or coercive behaviour is taken into account, the difference between the experiences of male and female victims becomes more apparent, with women experience greater negative impacts than men. But they've, all, they've just said they do not know how a man articulates the impact of coercive control. So a completely ridiculous statement after that. What they say at the end is future research is required to investigate this further and to consider whether we should reword the current impacts or include additional impacts to address this. Well, they could have just actually left in one of the ones, the only one that they took out, which was the one where men were higher, and surely they should be conducting this research, which is not difficult to do. They could conduct this research before they start advising the government, because this document was in 2015, and to my knowledge, they have not done that research since. So this is a very disingenuous comment, um, and really shows that although... Even they were uncomfortable with the shenanigans that they pulled. They're actually not prepared to do the research to get a fair measure of the impact of coercive control. So returning to that statement we started with, controlling a coercive behaviour, primarily violent, a form of violence against women and girls, not correct. Underpinned by wider gender inequality, yet on a nation-by-nation -nation basis, no evidence that that is um, what pushes coercion in the UK or other westernised nations. Um, it can contribute to uh, the ability of the offender to retain power and control and ultimately the ability of the victim to leave safely. T being unable to take your children with you which is something that is far more likely to be experienced by men, vastly far more likely, is the ultimate barrier to leave in a relationship which is violent. They have presented no evidence and cannot present any robust evidence that supports the statement it is important to consider the role of gender in the context of power and control when uh, within a relationship when identifying controlling or coercive behaviour in heterosexual relationships there is no evidence to suggest that is the case because when you ask men and women the same questions in surveys we find very little difference at all between men and women that is a that is a political statement not an evidence-based one and it must be ideologically driven and I think the reason that it's accepted by society is because men and women are just seen as uh, very different in terms of their uh, physical ability to assault a partner. 
it is probably at least partly the reason that society that people in the general public accept this narrative so completely allow this level of weak research to form public policy and guide legislation and training of police and the judiciary literally training men that coercive control is something that women experience and men perpetrate that domestic violence is something that women experience and men perpetrate this is how they are trained and it is probably at least partly accepted by professionals who mean the best of you know mean want the best for society and members of the public because men are bigger and stronger than women and and that alone probably gives it some prima facie uh, validity it's, it seems logical that if, if you're looking at violence in relationships it would be men because they're bigger and stronger but that isn't what has happened in western nations if men were such savages there would be no human race there would be no women alive if men were just using their raw strength to persecute women what we know and probably something that's been uh, selected for throughout evolution because men are so much stronger than women and women are uh, less able to fight a man that men reduce their aggression when it is towards a woman and this is what we find across the board in western society if men are asked about their aggression to a, another, another man versus aggression to a woman men will say uh, always report that they would be more likely to hit a man than they would a woman women actually show the opposite but women would be more likely to hit their partner than they would to hit a female friend so women are more likely to hit partners and men are less likely to hit partners and uh, john archer in 2006 did, uh, conducted a meta-analysis which is a very robust uh, way of re uh, reviewing the literature where he looked across nations and he found that as gender empowerment increased, men's violence towards women decreases. So men who live in Western nations with an expectation of gender equality strongly disapprove of domestic violence and, com uh, and complementary to this, their, relationship, their aggression to their partner is much lower than in countries where this belief is not held. So in patriarchal countries, places where beliefs are that women should be uh, subservient to men, their aggression is higher. But in Western nations, men's aggression towards women is very, very low, comparatively speaking. But what we find is, as gender empowerment increases, so women become more equal, men's violence towards women goes down, but women's violence towards their partners increases. So it appears but women, as they no longer, as they do not fear men or they understand that they have quite a lot of power in their own right, they feel more able to use aggression towards their partners. Because really what we're talking about in Western nations isn't physical power, it's real power. Real power isn't the size of your fist. Or the richest people in Britain would be the strongest people in Britain. They would be the biggest, strongest men would have all the money. That isn't what happens, as we all know, if we look at um, the likes of uh, millionaires. There's very few of those could go any time in a boxing match with anybody. What real power is in a Western nation isn't muscle power. It's public opinion and societal uh, use of force so where you live in a nation where public opinions attitude is that <laughs> one should trust women trust women because they're women women this appears to be the idea is women don't lie women are pure lovely creatures who would never lie about such a thing when you live in a society with these spoken expectations, then when you go to a call to a domestic violence um, call out, if you're a police officer, say, 
and there's a man and a woman both saying they've been assaulted, then you are living in a society that's telling you that to trust women and definitely not to trust men. Men are quite maligned, uh, the, the, the maligned gender in our current society. And the thing with women is, and I am a woman, the thing with women is we know it's not just public opinion that's on our side. We know as women that we have the police on our side too. If we phone up the police and say our partner has assaulted us, it's very likely that he will be asked to leave the house, he may be arrested, he may be detained overnight, he may be charged and convicted based on our word alone. And this same man will find that when he tries to see his children, he is faced with a system of court which is entirely ineffective in allowing him to see children. His partner will be allowed to, if she chooses, um, stop him seeing the children for extended periods of time with very little, little um, in the way of sanctions towards her. But her, her accounts of the relationship will be seen as what actually happened and his will, any de deviation from his account, he will be seen as being uh, lying and being manipulative. The judiciary and the uh, police are trained to see domestic violence in a gendered way. The Home Office is explicit in this. The College of Policing is explicitly gendered uh, in their understanding of domestic abuse and violence. And therefore, a man should expect nothing more than a um, biased representation in court. And this is so prevalent across the Western world, this idea that women are to be trusted, women are to be protected, men are dangerous, men would probably, families would be better without them altogether. This mindset that men are somehow some toxic force who can't be trusted, who are coercive and oppressive towards women, it means that men cannot get a fair hearing in courts. And this is a form of coercive control in its own right. And it should be on any coercive control measure. This idea that women or your partner can use a legal and administrative system to coercively control you by protect, uh, um, threatening you with phoning the police, making a charge of domestic abuse, stopping you seeing your children. This is extremely severe and uh, impactful coercive control and it's not measured. It's not even it's not even allowed, one question is it allowed to stay on their questionnaire. And men who have been through the system have actually developed post-traumatic stress disorder and depression from legal and administrative coercive control. So not only is that female partner using her own coercive means, she is able to draw on the power of the state to coercively control and traumatise male victims. So to conclude, the UK government has decided to adopt a gendered understanding of intimate partner violence, domestic abuse and uh, more recently coercive control. This is not an evidence-based perspective. It has been pushed by um, prominent people who have a political ideological belief in patriarchal male conspiracies and female victimhood. This, at least in the case of domestic abuse in the UK, is not a valid picture. This isn't what the research tells us, it's not an evidence-based perspective. And indeed, not only is it not evidence-based, this perspective is leading, leaving men vulnerable to being coerced and abused not only by their partner but by the state. It also leaves children vulnerable to being left with a violent or coercive parent. It leaves women unable to see their own a coercive behaviour as a problem and that is bad for women too because women need to understand that their behaviour, their coercive behaviour will sabotage their relationships, it will negatively harm their children. And most women do not want to have poor relationships and do not want to harm their children any more than men do. And so by giving women a pass at every single point, 
not only are you doing a disservice to men and their, and children, you're doing a disservice to women because women need to know that their behaviour has an impact, that it is negative and it is inappropriate and actually now criminal and therefore it should be recognised and they should be helped to find a different way of meeting their relationship needs. The research suggests that men and women are far more similar than different in the use of coercion and coercive control and the government should remove all reference to gendered ideological beliefs which have no sound basis in empirical research and instead work towards actually solving problems of coercion and violence in relationships and recognise that if men are similar to women in lots of other things as William Shakespeare said why would they not be similar in this? Thank you.